Okay, so let's uh, talk quickly about uh, LibreOffice. It's almost 10 years. Uh, it looks like yesterday, but it's almost 10 years since we launched the, pro the project. And, uh, but although it's 10 years almost, uh, we still uh, receive a lot of questions on why we, we, we launched LibreOffice. So uh, we have explained that in multiple places, but then we realized that that would never happen at FOSDEM. So I try to make it clear some points. Uh, this is more or less the history explained. So uh, everyone, uh, uh, we, we have an heritage in open office that was uh, created in 2000 and uh, was basically ended its life in 2011 and OpenOffice was forked twice, was forked by LibreOffice and was forked by Apache OpenOffice. Uh, this has to be clear, Apache OpenOffice was a fork, they changed the license completely, so this is a fork, it's not a continuation. Uh, the history of OpenOffice is rather well known, uh, it was started in the year 2000 when uh, uh, Sun uh, acquired Start Division, a German product. Uh, OpenOffice was developed in Hamburg with a number of developers that were uh, uh, employees of this company, Start Division. Start Division was acquired by Sun, uh, and Sun decided to donate the source code to uh, the open source community. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, open source was already popular, but uh, OpenOffice was the first, we can say, end user facing product uh, that was uh, uh, donated to the uh, open source community. Uh, op OpenOffice is on the desktop. Uh, at the time, most of the uh, open source software was on the servers, and of course, you had the uh, email, uh, uh, but the relationship between uh, the end user and the, and the software, I can tell you, is radically different in the case of OpenOffice uh, and LibreOffice today, and in the case, for instance, of uh, Thunderbird. And uh, in uh, uh, October 2008, uh, OpenOffice 3 was released, and we can consider OpenOffice 3 as the father of the modern uh, uh, open office and liberal office. Uh, but the reality is that the uh, relationship between Sun and community members was not always ideal, was uh, probably perceived as ideal outside the project, but not was, ide was not ideal inside the project. So in 2005, the members of the community started to challenge Sun uh, on something that was not really working. Uh, the reality is that there was a community council with uh, seven members, three members elected by Sun, three members elected by the community, and the community member that should have been uh, uh, super partes, and reality was uh, uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, in, in Italian, we say Zerbino, which is uh, uh, the, uh, when you enter your house, you have uh, that uh, tapestry where you clean your feet, and that was the position of the community manager versus Sun, okay? So it was even more loyal to Sun than Sun employees. So the reality is that all discussions were four to three, because there were always four votes for Sun and three for the community. So anything that was uh, suggested by the community was not, real, was not then put into, into being. So uh, one year after, this happened in Capodistria, at the conference in Capodistria. One year after, Sun felt the need of explaining something. So they made a presentation, and this, was a, this is a famous slide from this presentation, because they say, we will reduce the code complexity. If you look at the, 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 the code of uh, OpenOffice in 2005, uh, Someone that is not a developer will be frightened, and a developer will start thinking about who has developed that code. Uh, uh, improvement of patch handling. There, there is a famous patch that, that was, uh, let's say, frozen in a repository for 28 months before being approved. And the patch was a patch that allowed calc 
to become uh, to, to improve the compatibility with Excel. Uh, it was not making a clone of Excel, which is something that many people would like to, to have. They, they would like to have a clone instead of a product that has a, his own originality, but improved dramatically the compatibility. So it was very important, but because the guy was not, fit, let's say, was not community compliant according to Sun, then his patch was frozen for 28 months. So the day it was merged, it was old. It was okay, but it was old. This guy is Kohei Yoshida, is still a LibreOffice uh, uh, contributor. And the, the last one was mentoring newbies. Uh, OpenOffice code is uh, rather complex, and today is as complex as well. So if you want new contributors, uh, you have to mentor them to get into the code. So this is what we are trying to do at the moment. Then in 2000, so the community and Sun were discussing. So it, it was not completely friendly. For instance, I entered the open office community in 2004. I have been a marketer for all of my life and uh, handling high tech marketing project as a consultant. So when I entered the community, I started doing marketing of open office in Italy. And then I got a, one day I got a nice email from Sun marketing director in Italy and said, can you please stop sending out your press releases because the press picks up your press releases and doesn't pick up Sun press releases. And I said, uh, two answers. First, you can you can uh, fire me whenever you want. Second, fire the PR agency of Sun. <laughs> because if the PR agency is not able to write a good press release, then uh, if the fault is not mine, it's the PR agency. Of course, he said, but you are a volunteer. He said, you got the problem. You cannot fire me. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2009, this happened, Oracle acquired Sun, uh, but the community that had started to think about a fork, uh, what did? At that time, we, we, we just speeded up the discussions. This happened just before the, the uh, conference in Orvieto. I, Orvieto is a city in Italy. I was one of the organizers of the conference in Orvieto, and I said, Let's look at what happens. If um, Oracle sends a manager that has a budget, okay, that can mean that they are interested in the pro project. If they send someone that has not a budget, I've been a, a, an executive in American corporations, so I know what it means. If you have a budget, you, 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 you count something. If you don't have a budget, you are uh, at zero in the reality. Sorry to say for those people that do not have a budget, but this is, it's useless that we, we, we tell us uh, things that are not true. So they sent a very nice guy without a budget. And I said, okay, so it's better that we really fork the project. So we, we basically reverted the paradigm. So Sun was a nice umbrella for the community, but we decided to revert the umbrella and uh, uh, this is uh, a, a friend of mine, he's American, so in, 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 in America there is the mixing bowl uh, paradigm. We use more, at least in southern, in southern Europe, the boat where we say everyone has to row in the same direction. But the concept is the same, so we empower the community. So on September 28, 2010, we forked. And uh, we announced uh, the project and we announced uh, the Document Foundation. This is the very first uh, page of the website. Of course, uh, this is obsolete uh, uh, and uh, the, the website is different today. But the reality is that we, uh, we structured the community according to what was our experience. So first the decision. We will never, uh, never, never have a community manager. It was the most hated person in the community. So you don't want a community manager. 
If, you, if he's the most hated person in the community, you don't want another one. And uh, we decided to create a foundation. For historical reasons, the foundation was based in Germany. Uh, and uh, any, any foundation law is different, and anyone has good size and bad size. So having a foundation in Germany is not better than having it in the States, and vice versa. Uh, probably is less flexible to have it in Germany, but on the other side, the solidity is probably higher because you need to have uh, to demonstrate that you have uh, uh, reserves for years, which is not true for 501s in the States. Uh, so we create a foundation where we have uh, members, uh, and uh, we have, uh, it's, this is not updated to yesterday, but I mean, it's, we have 2006 members, not 2010, because membership is one year and uh, can be renewed if, if you continue to contribute. So when, uh, to, to members, to people that apply for membership, we ask uh, if they contributed in the past six months, and we ask if they plan to contribute in the next six months. Of course, we know that they are volunteers, so it's, we, we don't want uh, a, a signature on a contract, but at least, uh, you know, mindset that says, for the next six months I will do something in the community. And then we have a membership committee that is the the, the committee that evaluates memberships, and then we have a board of directors. And the two, and these are two formal bodies, so each, both bodies control each other, in a sense that if, to be a director, you have to be a member. So it's true that you, you, you are independent in taking your decision, but of course the membership committee can check if you are um, respecting the status, you are respecting the basic principles of the community. Then we have an advisory board. Advisory board companies uh, can, are uh, uh, both not-for-profit, and of course if they are not for pro, we have uh, Free Software Foundation, Free Software Foundation Europe, KDE, GNOME, uh, and if they are not for profit they don't pay anything of course. Then we have companies, companies that are members of the e ecosystem and they pay according to their, uh, to their turnover. But the, what they pay is uh, not a substantial amount of money because uh, we wanted to have uh, an independent uh, project. So we didn't want to have any company being able to, to tell, uh, I put you know, $1 million on the table so I have a say in how you do or you manage the community. So basically the community and the money that we have, I'm uh, part partially paid by TDF. We have three full-time employees and several consultants. Uh, we are controlled by the two, the two uh, organisms that are in the foundation, and uh, most of our revenues are based on donations. So far, they've been uh, rather organic. We will uh, start to do some more serious fundraising just because the project has grown and we need more money to grow further the project. And uh, the other companies so are either contributing to the project or they have an interest. So we have Red Hat, for instance, uh, but we have Collabora and CIB that are companies that contribute to the development. So what we decided to have in, uh, as uh, principles, these are the five, so copyleft license, no contributor agreement, based on meritocracy, community governance, and vendor independence in both uh, membership committee and uh, board of directors. We have a, a, a barrier on 30% of the votes. So any, no company can control more than 30% of the votes of both uh, uh, bodies. Uh, this means that if there are representatives of a company, either they are so good to convince the others that what they propose is for the good of the project or what they would like to be, see implemented will not be implemented. Uh, and of course, uh, <coughs> 
it has to be clear that although it looks like we are only focused on uh, uh, LibreOffice, uh, we do a lot more in terms of, for instance, our local communities do a lot of education about open source. I'm a member, of course, of the Italian, in addition to be a founder and a member of the global community, I'm a member of the Italian community, and I'm speaking almost every week in schools about free software, digital citizenship. I almost never speak only about LibreOffice, because we think that we have one of our roles as open source advocates as to be, as to increase the open source awareness in general, open source and open standards. So this is uh, uh, what we were uh, uh, aiming, and uh, I think that we, we achieved more or less uh, what we were aiming. Um, of course, uh, you know LibreOffice. I hope that you use LibreOffice, although we are rather democratic. We only, uh, we, we, we only not, we will, I won't, if you don't use LibreOffice, I won't greet you anymore in my life. But that's the simple thing that I, I will do. Uh, what the developers have done, because we have, we have something that I, I don't know if it's common, but for uh, now, for nine years in a row, we have three or more developers each month, uh, every month. And this is thanks to the, 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 the senior developers have created easy stuff to do, easy contribution, have picked up in uh, really cherry picked in the, in the code uh, something that was easy and accessible to people. So, and we have called them easy acts. And they're renewed periodically, so you have always new easy acts. And easy acts uh, have the objective of lowering the barrier to entry. Because the barrier to entry to a 7.5 million lines of code uh, beast uh, can be quite high. So this has been uh, uh, one of the big achievements, I think. Uh, we use time-based release, I think that everyone is conscious of that, seeing two major releases and every year since, uh, since almost forever. We have achieved uh, something of the things that the community was asking to sign uh, in 2005-2006. So mentoring new people, making it easier to access the code, uh, remove deprecated libraries. Uh, if you look at the code today, it's dramatically different from the code in, uh, that we have inherited in 2010. Uh, but then what happened, and this of course happened a few years ago in 2011, we, when, of course when we created the foundation, we invited all the stakeholders to be member of the foundation. And this was the answer, so they donated uh, open office to Apache Foundation, and people think that this was an oracle move. And then, uh, why don't you ask a couple of questions on this fact? So, I, IBM usually takes 15 days to write a press release, and in 20 minutes after open office was donated to Apache Foundation, they issued a press release, three blog entries, quoting each other and linked to each other. And the call that they did uh, one week before ended with, we will kill you. I, I, I did not say that. They told me, we will kill you. And I said, sorry, I won't be able to close IBM, although I would like <laughs> to do that. Uh, but at least uh, you, will have, you will not have a nice time in front of you. And uh, I'm not happy to say that I won, because this is not the way that open source should work. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the first peculiarity of LibreOffice is that the first FOSS project supposed to be killed by another FOSS project, intentionally created for that. And this is something that still continues today. There is a gentleman that today has tweeted an incredibly idiot stuff, sorry, uh, I would like to meet him, but he's not here at Fosman because I would like to tell him how idiot it is. Uh, we have an extremely large community without a community manager. The software is localized in over 120 
uh, 110 languages. We have around 200 million of users worldwide, 100 million unique, and the other 100 are probably using more than one office suite. The project is self-sustaining, and it's really vendor independent. We have a huge amount of fun, and uh, as I said, we have attracted three or more developers uh, for uh, I, I was counting months before, but now we're counting years, so it's, uh, uh, I, I think, more around 100 months in a row, which I think is rather outstanding as a result, and that was my last slide. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer. If you don't have, I'm happy to have finished. Um, do you have any fear about the fact that IBM bought Red Hat for, uh, the, for the Libre Office and the Open Office? Uh, um, okay, so the, just make it clear that what I'm answering is totally personal, okay? It's not representing in any way the Document Foundation. So I have been a consultant to IBM. It's the only company I wrote a letter saying, Sorry, my liver doesn't want to be your consultant. I hate IBM as a company, okay? I really fear about Red Hat. That's personal, again. That's really personal. Completely personal. But IBM guys know that. I'm not the one that doesn't tell things in face to people. Because that, I think that their attitude to open source is tactical. They, they, they've spent a lot of money on open source, but they didn't invest in the community. And if you are a community member, you understand uh, how important is the community. We, we have always respected Red Hat as a company making profit on one side, but also helping the community on the, and, and living with the community on, in the other one. And if you are a community member, you know that the the, the, the usual concept of the corporation that says, I'm the one leading, doesn't work. I've tried to make, to, to explain it in, in this way. I've been an executive uh, vice president of Honeywell Corporation when Honeywell was a large IT company. So just to, to make the, 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 a comparison, I, I'm, I'm the same person, just after almost, let's say, 35 years later. I'm 65 now, and I was 30. Let's say that in, an, in, in, in a virtual world, me, I met myself 30 years ago. I would go to shake the hand, and the, the me 30 years ago would take a, a gun and shot me, okay? <laughs> because I was very corporate at that time, but the, the world has changed, and I've changed with the world. Corporation don't always change with the world. And I think it's a challenge for corporation, but I've not seen many of them uh, uh, taking this so seriously. And I can say that, for instance, I see more effort in Microsoft than in other companies in understanding open source, which I think is very positive. They make effort. Of course, they, they, they start from a completely different point of view but at least they try to do it in a proper way. Any other question? Who knows me, know that uh, to stop me speaking, you have to shoot me, but anyway. <laughs> that would be against the code of conduct. Hey, so you mentioned that you specifically did not want to have a contributor agreement. Could you perhaps elaborate as to why that was important? Sorry, can, can you speak louder? I can try. Um, you said that it was a specific goal not to have a contributor agreement. Can you explain why that was important, please? Uh, so I'm not a developer. So this was a decision from developers. Uh, it was part of uh, lowering the barrier to entry. Uh, they, they looked at other projects and they saw that when the contributor agreement was not in place, the barrier to entry for new people was lower. 
Of course, uh, uh, we filter. We, if you don't have a contributor agreement, you need a filter somewhere. Not a filter for people, but a filter for quality, of course. Because you, you don't, then you don't have any formal agreement between yourself and the person. So what the, the, the senior developers are doing, they are really overseeing uh, uh, new patches from new contributors in a way that they not only are quality assured, but the, the contributor feels as part of the community. So we, let's say that we try to create a, 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 a virtual contributor agreement based on uh, gentleman agreements between people and not a formal one. There is some kind of agreement but it's not written on paper. Thank you.